yes. Um, uh, the reason why I was asked to do this particular one is that um, quite, quite a few companies are now exporting UHT milk and, and a few ESL milk. And there's always uh, issues with um, any exported product. And uh, it's nice to know uh, what can go wrong and, and how, to, uh, how to address that. So that's what this, um, this one's all about. Uh, so it's a processing that um, it's usually around about 140, but it's somewhere between 138 and 145. Some might even go higher than that, but very few can go lower than that because you just cannot get the, uh, the amount of processing you need at much lower than 138. The whole idea is to just destroy all non-spore forming bacteria. That's all the ones that um, uh, are not going to be all that heat stable. And we'd like to destroy almost all of the spore, spore forming ones. So all the bacillus and certainly clostridium that um, uh, could be a pathogen we, we, we kill. The main bacteria of concern are the heat resistant bacillus series, the species. Uh, I mentioned clostridium. It's, um, it's certainly a, a bacterium of concern, but um, the processing conditions are more than sufficient to, to kill uh, clostridium. So we, 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 don't, um, we don't get too concerned about clostridium because the, uh, the conditions are so extreme. Uh, there are some bacillus species which I'll talk about, which uh, may get through the process. It's pack packaged aseptically, which is a very important point. So after we've um, killed all of our bacteria, we don't want any more to get into it while we're doing the packaging. And this, this, this happens in pasteurized milk. We get certainly bacteria coming in during the packaging process. We don't want that to happen in UHT milk that's basically sterile. We store it at room temperature, and that's one of the big advantages of UHT milk, and, and that's why it's seen as a, a very convenient product. And a lot of people do use um, uh, UHT milk as a, as a backup. Uh, they have some in the cupboard just in case uh, they run out of um, other milk. So storage at room temperature is, uh, is, a, is an important aspect of, of UHT milk. Its shelf life, I've got greater than or equal to six months. Now, if you, if you go to different parts of the world, you might find uh, their, their shelf life or the shelf life of their UHT milk is only about three months. But um, some places in Europe use UHT milk like we use pasteurized milk. So it doesn't, doesn't have to, um, to hang around very long. So it's, it's got a re relatively short shelf life. On the other side of the coin, um, some export markets really want a longer shelf life and, um, and at least nine months are being put on, on some of the, the uh, UHT milks. And some companies would, um, or some countries would like to um, impose a, a longer time than that. But that's really pushing it because uh, uh, after, after nine months, uh, things, things can start happening with UHT milk. So UHT processing is used for, for a, a range of different products, principally white milk, but certainly more and more flavoured milks are being done that way, uh, modified milks. Cream, of course, is a, is a big issue. There's uh, a lot of UHT cream produced, um, both thickened and unthickened. Custard is another one that's, um, that's available. And of course, the non-dairy dairy beverages. And uh, as you go around the world, you'll find there's uh, numerous ones of these. And we're seeing more and more of these on our, on our shelves now, uh, things like oat milk and so forth. So there's, there's, there's a lot of them around. Now, ESL processing is similar, but it has some major differences. It's not heated as, as much. Uh, 120 to 138, pretty reasonable range for UHT processing. And it's usually treated for less than five seconds. Um, the trick is, of course, to treat it at a high temperature for a very short time. That gives us our maximum kill of bacteria uh, with a minimum of, of chemical change and hence flavor change. Um, in, in the West, they have a, a, a category of milk called ultra-pasteurized milk. And that's specified to be heated at um, at least 138 for at least two seconds. Now that's um, uh, that's a fairly high um, intensity heating, but it's not. Um, it's still sub UHT, so it, it does fall in, into what we call ESL, uh, which, by the way, is extended shelf life. Uh, if uh, if I hadn't mentioned that, 
So air cell processing destroys all of our non-spore forming bacteria, uh, as does UAT, including, of course, our pathogenic bacteria. And the, it, it kills most of the spore formers, but some of the more resistant ones uh, are not killed. So you don't get as many uh, spore formers killed in ear cell processing as you do in UHT processing. And importantly is the packaging. Most of the ear milk produced in the world is, is not packaged aseptically, but there's a, a bit of a trend now to package it aseptically because almost all of the contamination from ear cell uh, milks at the moment is coming after the heat treatment, um, not from the, the residual uh, bacteria that the, the heat is not knocking out. So the, the packaging process is just so important in terms of the, the shelf life of uh, ESL milk. Uh, using very clean packaging conditions, uh, you can get a very long shelf life, but occasionally you don't, which, um, which just means that sometimes you've got some bacteria there which will get through and will cause uh, some problems with your shelf life. So our main bacterial issues are certainly the post-heat treatment ones, those, those um, that come in the packaging process. Uh, that's if it's not packaged aseptically. And even if it's packaged aseptically, we've got some psychotrophic spore-forming bacteria. These are ones that can grow at low temperature, which is where, uh, which is how the ESL milk is stored. Um, and a couple I've mentioned there, Bacillus cereus and Bacillus circulans. There's a few more that I could have put down there. I particularly mentioned Bacillus cereus because a small percentage of Bacillus uh, cereus um, uh, strains uh, are, are actually pathogenic and a few are psychotrophic. They're not all psychotrophic and they're not all pathogenic, but occasionally you'll get one which is uh, pathogenic and psychotrophic and which can grow at low temperatures and hence can be a, a pathogen in, um, uh, in milk. That's very rare, but um, people are, are very aware that that, uh, that can happen. Of course, ESL milk has to be refrigerated, uh, and that's a major difference between ESL milk and UHT milk. The shelf life, um, I've got 30 plus days there. It's um, almost impossible to put a, a, a figure on it, and it really depends entirely on the heat, heat treatment and packaging, and particularly on the packaging. Uh, it's used for white milk, flavoured milk, modified milk, uh, and custards. I, I don't know of um, uh, creams or other uh, other milks, but I, I it, it could easily it could easily be. So just a summary table there uh, in terms of UHT milk being commercially sterile, which is a term we use to describe a product where the bacteria won't grow if, it, if the, the product is stored under normal conditions. So normal conditions, I suppose, for a UHT milk is, is less than, say, 40 degrees. But sometimes uh, milk can be stored at higher temperatures than that, and I'll, I'll come back to that one later. And that can cause us some, some problems. ESL milk, of course, is not commercially sterile. It does contain some spore formers, and they, they could grow at temperature. Um, and, and a few can grow at, um, at very low temperature. Uh, UHT milk always packaged aseptically, ESL milk can be, but um, no, not always. Store at room temperature, store at refrigerator. Uh, long shelf life for UHT, much shorter shelf life for ESL milk. And I guess the last one, which I haven't mentioned, is that UHT milk uh, has a definite cooked or heated flavour, and I guess a lot of people uh, would recognise that, and it's been, a, I guess, a, a criticism of UHT milk over, over many years. ESL milk is much closer to pasteurised milk. Uh, if, you, if you look at the two side by side, taste the two side by side, you can taste a small difference. You might um, notice a, a flat in flavour rather than that bright flavour of, of pasteurised milk, but certainly not um, an intense cooked flavour uh, like you get in UHT milk. Okay, so what are the issues with exported milks? Um, and I guess the, the, the first one to mention is the quality of the raw material. It's the old story. You can't make a silk purse from a sow's ear. So you can't make good ESL milks or UHT milks out of uh, poor quality raw milk. 
Uh, that comes through time and time again. And I guess some of the reasons for that will become obvious uh, uh, soon. Uh, the processing conditions, the time and the temperature uh, of the, um, the process. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, the, the higher the, the temperature and the longer the time, the, the more cooked flavour you're going to get, but it also has other uh, effects at all. The temperature and the time of, of transport and storage, and that's, um, that's one of these uh, unknowns for, for a lot of uh, manufacturers. They, they don't quite know how long the, the, uh, the transport's going to take, how long the storage is going to be before the product is consumed. And the other thing they don't know is just how variable that, um, that temperature, for example, might be uh, during the, um, the, the transport. Um, I mentioned the, the high, high temperature problems for, for UHT milk and of course um, ESL milk is probably even more um, of a problem in terms of um, the, the temperature of, of storage. It has to be, has to be low. Um, so just going on from that, the temperature can vary from uh, if, if a, a product is exported. Um, some of the countries certainly are at less than zero degrees and, and it certainly can go over 50 degrees. Uh, across the equator, or um, if it's in um, warehouses in some places where the temperatures can reach uh, greater than 50 degrees. And these are the things that we, we don't think a lot about, but uh, I think every manufacturer needs to be uh, aware that these things uh, can happen. And the last one is package integrity. And um, I'm not going to talk about that because it's, uh, uh, it's an issue sort of outside of this, this particular uh, webinar, but it's something that has to be taken into account, um, and all companies are, are aware of of the need for uh, for that uh, because of the uh, uh, the problems of transport, uh, distorting the, the package, uh, rupturing the package, and so forth. So that that's a big one, but um, um, I'm not discounting it because it's, it's not not important. So let's have a look at some of the issues with UHT milk, some of the uh, issues and their causes and, and their remedies. I guess the first one is flavour, and that's uh, uh, the old favourite of, uh, of UHT milk. Everybody talks about its flavour. Um, I think a lot of people believe the flavour of UHT milk is much better these days than it, it was in the past because uh, the manufacturer is aware of some of the issues that, um, that cause um, the very very cooked flavour in in, um, uh, in UHT milk and some of the flavour changes that can occur during storage. This this little diagram here gives you some sort of approximation of some of the flavour uh, elements. Uh, when you first um, make UHT milk, it's got a very sulphury uh, flavour, mainly due to hydrogen sulphide, but other sulphur compounds as well. That decreases over the first week or so. Uh, mainly through oxidation, all all milk's going to have some oxygen in it, some dissolved air, so the sulphur compounds are oxidised and become much less flavoursome. The heated flavour is um, is quite intense early, and it um, it decreases over time, but probably not as much as that little bar, that little green bar there suggests. It, it's, there's going to be a heated flavour remain in UHT milk for for most of its uh, its shelf life. But then, particularly with uh, fat-containing uh, milks, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole milk as opposed to skim milk, for example, uh, you start getting stale flavour, and that's due entirely to oxidation of the, uh, uh, of, of the fatty acids. And if we've got some um, uh, stray um, enzymes there, um, lipases can cause rancid flavours and, and proteases cause, cause bitter flavours. In general, they're not going to come up until later in the, uh, uh, in the storage. Well, you hope they won't. If, uh, if they come up much earlier than that, then obviously that the raw milk was of very poor quality. So the cooked flavour, um, and I've been through some of these. Um, uh, Maillard reaction products are one of the ones that uh, contribute to the heated flavour. Uh, this is the Maillard reaction is where the lactose interacts with the, the proteins in milk and then that, they, those, um, those complexes break down into a whole lot of different products, 
some of those are, are quite flavoursome. Uh, bitter, as I mentioned, that can come through from the, the proteases of either the bacteria in the raw milk or, or plasmin. Uh, that's the, the natural uh, milk protease. The rancid or, or soapy flavours are due to the, the free fatty acids that are produced by um, uh, lipases. These are residual bacterial lipases, ones that aren't uh, inactivated by the, the high temperature in the UH2 process. Uh, they're not due to the, the uh, milk lipase, which is, is readily uh, inactivated at, even at uh, pasteurisation temperatures. The last one there is acid or sour. And uh, if you get that, then you're pretty certain that you've got some bacterial fermentation, which is um, pointing towards a, a contamination of bacteria. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, uh, in a little while. So some of the uh, remedies. Uh, cooked flavour. I guess the only thing you can do with cooked flavour is to minimise the severity of the UHT process, and, and a lot of companies have done that. They've optimised the, the process so that they, they get a, uh, a minimum amount of, um, of, of cooked flavour. Uh, it's uh, there are um, downsides to reducing flavour, and because it, um, it then uh, reduces the um, the shelf life in, in other ways, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those. So I put minimising C star, and some of them you'll be well aware of C star. It's a it's an index of the the amount of um, uh, heat treatment that causes chemical damage to the to the product. So minimising C star is a, is minimising the amount of um, heat input. The star oxidised flavour, uh, minimising oxygen content is is the most important, and here direct processing, things like steam injection and steam infusion, uh, you get a lot less oxygen because you have a vacuum system to remove the excess water. Um, so it might only have one to one to two milligrams per litre of oxygen, whereas indirect processes, uh, there's no vacuum system uh, to remove any of the, uh, any of the, uh, the air uh, in general, unless, unless you have a aerator, and that's not common in this country. Uh, so it can be seven to nine milligrams per litre. Uh, so a lot of this, um, a lot of the oxygen can come from the headspace. Uh, oxidation of the sulphur compounds produces up quite a bit of the oxygen. Uh, but if you've got a fairly big uh, headspace in the in the, the package, then it, it will be uh, can, uh, um, the, the oxygen can um, can then be taken from that headspace into the into the product. And I've just put up there the the amount of headspace that you will get in some of the different um, packaging um, that um, we put UHT milk in. The Tetra Brick, which is probably the most common one, as little as eight mils per litre, and some of them have even less than that. Uh, so very very low um, headspace volume. The Combi Block, where the um, the the package is preformed, uh, about 34 mils per litre. And then the, the plastic bottles, are something like 58 um, mils per litre. So the plastic bottles have, um, have have the largest headspace, and hence you would expect to to have the the, the most problems in terms of um, stale and oxidised flavours. Uh, the bitter and rancid flavours. Um, the only way to really avoid those is to is to minimise the the bacterial count in the raw milk. Uh, this this minimises the amount of enzyme that's produced by those bacteria before we heat it. And the, bac the, the bacteria might be knocked out, but the, the enzymes aren't necessarily knocked out even by UHT treatment. So we really don't like to, to process um, raw milk, which has got more than, um, say, 10 to the 5, 100,000 um, bugs per mil uh, for UHT. Uh, of course, we'd like less than that if possible, but we, we know that if we get um, uh, more than that, we're very likely to have have problems with uh, bacterial uh, enzymes. Somatic cells are the other ones. Um, these are the, the cells that come through mostly from mastitis. Uh, and I've put there, preferably we'd like to have less than 200,000. I know a lot of people in Australia are producing milk with a lot less than 200,000, um, some less than 20,000, which, which is great. Um, the, problem, the, the problem with uh, high somatic cell counts is that Somatic cells have plasmin as well, 
uh, that, that increases the amount of plasma in the milk, which can cause um, bitter flavours. So um, somatic cells and your counts uh, are most important. And I've got preheat conditions to minimise the residual plasma, and I'll, I'll come back to that one later because um, in some ways that's, uh, that's one of the most important things that have come out in, in recent years. The sour or acid flavour, um, due to bacterial growth, and sometimes we get gas with it. If, if you get gas with it, you'll obviously see that because the, the packages will swell up. Uh, but it can be without gas, and this is what's called a flat sour effect, mostly due to the thermophilic spore formers, things like um, geobacillus. Um, but these can only grow at very high temperatures, so we only get this sort of problem where the the product is temperature abused and we and, and the temperature uh, gets to say 45 degrees and if it gets over 50 degrees then any, any of these that are left in the in the milk will start to start to grow and and produce acid so there are some good reasons why we don't really want to um, keep milk at, at greater than about 45 degrees okay the next one is age gelation and and this is a an age old one it's um, it's been around a long time. Um, it'll probably be with us for forever more. But there are there are things we know that we can do to to minimise it and to almost eliminate it. So uh, it is a main issue with um, with UHT milk and and I mentioned before that some some places would like to have um, even more than nine months shelf life. The chances of it, it, it gelling after that time are uh, are quite so. It's not. Um, uh, it's not best to keep keep um, UHT milk for for much longer than, than nine months. Uh, even up to nine months, everything has to be uh, to right to be for for the milk to be stable. What happens is you get a, a gradual increase in viscosity um, over time, and some people can contract this and, and give an indication of um, the likelihood of uh, the milk uh, turning into a gel. Uh, then the the increase becomes quite rapid, and after that you get this gel being formed and it's um, it presents in different ways. Some say it's like a like a custard, sometimes in it, sometimes flakes, uh, sometimes a thick layer on the bottom, sometimes a thick layer on top. So um, it's a thickening of the of the milk and it's it's a thickening of the of the protein um, is, is really a, uh, an issue of, of gelation. It's quite different from sedimentation which I'll I'll talk about um, a little bit later. Once the gel is formed, there's not much you can do about it. You can shake it up and you can back up the lumps, but that's about all you do. Uh, there's nothing that I know of that will, um, if you've got a UHT milk with the gel, just to, to turn it into a, um, a normal milk. Uh, it occurs more rapidly in concentrated milks. Um, we're not going to go into concentrated milk so much today because it's, I guess it's not, um, not a common um, exported but um, most of the exported are, are certainly not concentrated. So there are a lot of factors that affect age gelation, and, and these uh, we need to know about if we're going to control it. Uh, storage temperature is is, uh, is a major one. Protease activity is probably the major one. Severity of heat treatment, I'll, I'll go through these more in detail in a moment. Quality of the raw milk, and I've mentioned a little bit about that. Season and stage, stage of lactation, it's an, a new one, and, and, and a little bit on, on additives which people have used to try and control uh, age gelation. So the storage temperature, uh, we know that if we store milk, store steam milk at low temperature, refrigeration temperature, we're very unlikely to get um, age gelation over many, many months. Uh, however, the uh, that sort of negates the advantage of HT milk in that you can keep it at room temperature. So while that might be a solution, it's it's not um, it's not ideal. And high temperatures greater than 35 and 40 curiously um, actually reduce the amount of age gelation. They they um, uh, because of some things going on in the milk which prevent the age gelation. So that's that's a rather curious one. Normally. With um, changes, we expect to get more changes at, at high temperature than, than at lower temperature. In this case, that's that's not true. Of course, the, the temperatures in the middle, 25 to 30, are optimal. 
and that's unfortunately the uh, the temperature that um, a lot of the milks are going to be stored at. So uh, that doesn't help us too much in terms of um, being able to get around the problem. Uh, we're not going to advocate that um, people store at 35 to 40 degrees, and we're certainly not going to suggest they, they keep it at, at, at four degrees. Protease activity, this is, this is probably the big one. Um, there's a pretty good correlation between proteolysis in UHT milk and gelation. I put there usually because there have been reports of instances where um, it doesn't seem to be uh, a direct correlation between proteolysis and, and age gelation. And I, I mentioned concentrated milk before. This certainly doesn't hold for concentrated milk. Um, other things operating, other, other mechanisms operating in concentrated milk. The protease can be from bacteria, and these are the bacteria that grow in the raw milk, so that's a good reason for not wanting a high level of, that, of uh, bacteria in the raw milk, and the native milk placement. And so that's always going to be there in, in, um, in our milk, so we have to look at ways of, uh, of getting over that. So if we look at those two in, in, in detail, the bacterial proteases, this is probably the major cause of gelation. Um, you don't need very much of it there to, to cause problems. Uh, so say they're produced in the milk by psychotropic bacteria, the ones that are growing at cold temperatures. Mostly pseudomonas is the most important bacterium uh, that causes this problem. They survive the UHT treatment. You, know, you kill the bacteria, the enzymes remain. And they mostly attack and <laughs> Uh, that should be kappa case in there. Um, the kappa didn't come, come through. Uh, so this is very similar to rennet, and that's why you do get um, uh, an, an effect which is very similar to what you get when you add rennet during, during cheese making. So it's much the same effect. It's a, it's a clotting effect. Plasma's a little bit different. Um, again, it's quite stable to, to high temperatures. Um, but we can inactivate it in the preheat section of the UHT um, uh, plant. So that's, I've got their most significant. I, I believe that's one of the most important things. If we can get, get rid of that through a preheating process, something like 90 degrees to 30 to 60 seconds. There are other combinations which can, but that's uh, a fairly common one that's used, and that should get rid of almost all of the plasma there. So that sort of eliminates that, that problem. Um, Early and late lactation milk, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, um, can, can be an issue. Higher and mastitic milk, and I've already mentioned that one, that uh, somatic, cell, somatic cells carry some, some plasma as well. Um, it increases during storage. In, in raw milk, uh, when it comes from cow, you've got a mixture of plasmin and also the plasminogen, which turns into plasmin during storage. There's a lot more plasminogen there than there is plasmin. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important that it happens, uh, you get more and more plasma being formed uh, during, during storage. Now it mostly attacks, it's not the same as kappa casein, the beta casein this time, uh, to give gamma casein. So sorry about those little, little squares, but um, it didn't come through in the process. Uh, so that means that it attacks a different uh, casein and it gives products. And because of that, we can we can actually uh, determine which which problem we've got, whether it's a plasma problem or a bacterial problem, just looking at the the, the types of uh, of peptides, the the products of the uh, of the action of the, of the, the enzymes. As I said, you, the gelation can be caused by very very low levels, as little as one nanogram per mil. Now. If you think of a nanogram, that's 10 to the minus 9 of a gram. That's not very much in a, in a mill of milk. So um, you don't need um, a lot of enzyme to be, to be produced in the raw milk to cause one in UHT milk. Keep in mind that UHT milk is being stored for a long time at, for an enzyme anyhow, a nice uh, convenient uh, temperature. So uh, six months at, um, say, 20 to 30 degrees is uh, is very nice for an enzyme to act, and uh, so you don't need a lot there to, to cause um, some proteolysis during, during storage. Very difficult to measure a nanogram per 
the middle of, of proteases. There are some studies around, but most of them are, are not very sensitive, or they take um, a long time to um, to do. It is possible, but um, you probably need uh, several days to to get a, a good result from from the uh, assays that are available. Um, but what you can do is monitor the increase in the the proteolysis, the increase in the the peptides that are formed in the in the milk during during storage, and this gives a very good indication of whether or not the the milk is going to gel. Uh, so that's um, uh, that's a, that's a process that, that some companies use. Uh, they, they all have storage samples, um, re retained samples. Uh, by doing a proteolysis test um, every every month or so, uh, will certainly give you, give you very good indication whether or not you have a problem with, uh, with gelation. The severity of heating um, is certainly a, 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 um, an, an element in uh, in age gelation, the more severe the heating, uh, the less likely you are to get uh, to get gelation. Now, of course, that's the opposite to what I said about the flavour. The flavour of milk is going to be better at the lower or the less in, in intense heating. So, there's always a balance in in this game as to whether you whether you heat it too too high uh, or heat it highly to give you less uh, age gelation, or whether you heat it quite um, uh, softly to um, to give it the best flavour. So there's always that trade-off. So because of the the influence of severe heating, uh, direct processed um, milk, that's steam injection or steam infusion, uh, that's a fairly um, uh, mild type of treatment in terms of the the, the chemical effect, and um, you'll tend to get more gelation with directly processed milk and with indirectly processed milk that's in um, tubular or, or plate heat exchanges. Uh, the, the severity of heat is mostly related to inactivation of the protease, but, but it also um, affects the uh, denaturation of the whey proteins. These are the soluble proteins in milk, and when you heat them, they tend to, to change. They tend to uh, attach themselves to the, to the uh, caseins. And if they attach themselves to caseins, that pre prevents the, the proteases getting to the caseins and, and reducing the, the proteolysis and hence um, extending the shelf life. So there are two different um, effects of the more severe heating there on, on age gelation. Quality of the raw milk. Uh, if you don't have a good quality raw milk to start with, then you're going to have problems. Uh, we've already talked about the the uh, relationship between bacterial counts and high somatic count, cell counts on the, the shelf life of the milk. Uh, and it's mostly the heat stable uh, enzymes that are produced, which are the, are the problem. Um, and the somatic cells, of course, carry uh, increased levels of plasma. Seasonal stage of lactation, I guess this is one that's often um, almost um, ignored in terms of UHT. It's certainly well known in um, for other products like powders that they don't have the same functional properties when produced at certain times of the, the season, which in, uh, in in a state like Victoria, for example, uh, equates pretty much with the stage of lactation. Uh, so in southern Australia, the um, early lactation milk corresponds pretty much to spring milk, and that's where you're likely to get um, more gelation because of the higher levels of, of, um, of plasma. But of course, we do have uh, some methods now to, to control through through the preheating pre process. So, so hopefully we can get over this problem by uh, using appropriate preheating conditions. Uh, some of the seasonal variations can be due to uh, mineral imbalance, um, and and um, we've looked at the casein to whey protein ratio as well, and and both and of course the plasma levels that I mentioned. So the the um, the composition of milk does change quite considerably during lactation, and that changes the, uh, the suitability of the milk for um, a lot of different products, including UHT milk. Additives, and um, I was going to say this is contentious. It's only contentious in that um, uh, adding things to milk is, um, is not seen as the, is, is the best approach. Um, and and um, 
But we do know that there's some additives which, when added to milk, will certainly reduce the amount of age dilation and um, and extend the, the shelf life of the milk. And the main one that's used um, by some companies is um, what's called polyphosphate or sodium hexametaphosphate, sometimes called Calgon, because um, some of you may have even used it in, in water softeners because it, it, um, it tends to bind, bind calcium and, and magnesium. Uh, it can be added before or after treatment, heat treatment, but of course adding it before uh, is probably preferable because if you add it after heat treatment, it's got to be added aseptically, which is always um, a little bit, um, bit dicey. It delays gelation, but it doesn't affect the proteolysis. So I've been saying that proteolysis is the main cause of age gelation, but in fact, here we have a situation where we have an additive which doesn't affect the proteolysis, but does affect the gelation. So the, the gelation really occurs in two stages. One is the proteolysis, and the second is where the, uh, the casein micelles come, come together and form, form a clot. And it's that second process that's of, of, the, of the second stage, which is inhibited by, by polyphosphate. And it's, it's due to the interaction of the calcium in the, in the casein uh, with the polyphosphate forming this complex which, um, uh, which doesn't gel. So, so that's, that's one, uh, one thing that, that people have gone into. Uh, but when I say phosphates, I, I have had that some of the, um, the simple phosphates, the monophosphates like disodium hydrogen phosphate, and this is one that's commonly used in, um, as a stabiliser because it, it neutralises ionic calcium. Uh, that's, um, that should never be added to UHT because that, that, that actually enhances um, gelation. So uh, polyphosphate and, and um, the monophosphates act in very different ways. Okay, fat separation. Um, now, if you have a look at UHT milk that's been stored a while, you'll probably find it's got a slight, um, hopefully slight, layer of fat on the top, or it might be clinging to the size of the container when you enter the container. A, a, lot, of, a lot of our milks, I guess, are, are in, um, in, in tetra bricks, so we, we don't tend to see the, the fat. Um, it's to me they're, they're in opaque container. You don't, you don't tend to see it unless you pour it out and um, and it's got uh, flakes of, of fat, but in, in general you'll get um, a small amount of, of, um, of fat separating out from almost all UHT milks. Um, keep in mind that we're keeping this, keeping the UHT milk for a pretty long time at a reasonable temperature, and so the emulsion of the fat in the milk has to be very good to, to withstand that completely. It's often, often due to insufficient homogenization. Um, that's, that can be due to uh, damage to homogenizer valves, or it could be due to the, uh, the lower homogenization pressures. We know that if we increase the homogenizer pressure uh, up to, say, 40 megapascals, which is probably higher than um, um, probably anybody uses in, in UHT milk, uh, but uh, we know that the, if we increase the pressure, we can reduce the amount of fat separation. Uh, but the, Damage to homogenize it is, uh, is an important one, and um, I know some people advocate using a, a microscope to have a look at the valves to, to see if there's any scoring of the valves. If there's any scoring of the valves, then some of the, some of the fat globules can pass through without being, um, uh, being affected, and they're the, they're the ones that can, can, can cause problems. The amount of fat separation is due to the size of the fat globules. Now, the average of average size of fat globules in normal milk is around about three microns. Um, that should be less than one micron for, for UHT milk. And um, the range is also important, not just the average, but the range of, of uh, fat globule sizes, because the large globules are, the, are the, uh, the real problem. If we've got a small number of large globules, they can cause a large amount of uh, fat separation. So a rule of thumb that um, some companies have used, and it's not universal and it's, it's, not, it's not foolproof, but um, it's an indication that the, the large ones are the problem. You should have less than 2% at greater than 5 microns. So sorry about all those little bits that didn't come through there. So that's um, uh, 5 microns. That uh, uh, should be a, a, 
a micrometer then, and less than 5% should be um, uh, greater than 2 microns. So less than 2% greater than uh, 5 microns, and less than 5% greater than 2 microns. The number of um, large ones does increase uh, during during storage, and this is due to uh, some of the small ones coming together to make make larger ones. The the cause of that's not always clear, and um, that's often the reason why we do get um, uh, fat separation during storage. One of the ways it can happen is um, uh, is associated with age dilation because when we homogenise look the casing mice cells become embedded into the the, uh, the fat globules, the, uh, the small fat globules. Uh, they basically act like big casing mice cells. So if you've got something which, which is affecting the casing mice cells, um, bringing them together, such as in age duration, then it's also going to affect the, the fat part. And if that um, if those globules are, are buoyant enough to rise to the top, um, once they get bigger through uh, uh, its coagulation uh, from the age gelation, then you'll, you'll start getting some fat separation. So, so you can get fat separation coming together with age gelation. Now sedimentation, I referred to that before and I said that age gelation and sedimentation are two different things. There's a little bit of confusion I think in the literature and some people um, are not too certain whether uh, where the sedimentation and age duration are the same, but sedimentation is really uh, refers to a fairly fine sediment which uh, which falls to the bottom. It certainly never goes to the top like like some um, some age duration gels. Uh, so it's it's a it's a fine layer in general that um, forms on the on the bottom of the container. Now all milks will have a slight amount, um, but it should only be something like 0.1% um, on a volume basis, so not very much. If you have a lot of it, then you can get a, a chalky taste. The reason for that is that the sediment uh, is largely uh, uh, calcium phosphate, so it, it, it'll, have a, it'll, it'll be uh, chalky in, in appearance and, and in taste. The sediment actually forms during processing, not during storage. It might um, might become evident during storage, but it doesn't occur during storage. It's it's the, it's the sediment that forms uh, during processing that eventually falls to the bottom during uh, during storage. Um, the cause is not always obvious, and, um, and I know some companies have had problems intermittently. Sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't. So we don't know um, just why that happens. Um, well, I certainly don't know why that happens. What we do know is that if you if you heat treat milk at a low pH and by low on less than about 6.5 pH, uh, keep in mind that milk is normally about 6.7, uh, then you've got a fair chance that some of the protein is going to become in, unstable and it's going to um, uh, coagulate and it's going to fall to the fall to the bottom. Actually. So. Um, it's, it's due to the casein mice cells clumping together uh, and then eventually falling to the bottom. It's, uh, the mineral balance is, um, is significant here. We do know that if we've got a high level of ionic calcium, uh, that can, can, can be a major problem. And, um, and we do know that the uh, severity of heating uh, also affects the amount of, of, of severity. So it's um, also affects the, the amount of sedimentation. The sedimentation um, uh, certainly can be higher in, in certain circumstances. A, a classic one is goat milk, and some of you might have uh, been involved with goat. It has a naturally high ionic calcium level, so unless you do something about that before you UHT treat, it's almost impossible to UHT treat goat's milk. So just adding some um, phosphates or something like, something like that can, can help that situation. Calcium fortified milk, and we've, we've got quite a lot of that, of course, and that's often um, done using some of the insoluble salts, um, such as calcium carbonate or calcium citrate. 
when there's a supply, they're supplied in very fine form, so it, it, um, it, they, they um, assimilate into, into the milk quite well. But over a period of time, they can um, fall out and, and, and cause a sediment. Uh, chocolate milk, of course, and um, everybody knows that um, uh, the cocoa particles will um, will fall out over time. Um, there's chocolate milk's always stabilised with, uh, with things like carrageenan to hold them in uh, in suspension. But um, some of these cocoa particles are quite dense and um, and and can can sediment over time. So I guess we we, we we're fairly used to to shaking the chocolate milk before we we drink it on a product and hence we get more sediment in our directly heated milk than we do in our indirectly heated milk.